Thank you, John. God bless the reading of the word today. Before I get started, I, I saw this thing in the paper this week, and in, in oddly enough, the obituary column. And um, I cut it out. It was one of those Rob Bell moments. I'm like, this is going to be useful somewhere. And I'm just, I'm not even going to let today get by without reading it on this Father's Day. Um, turns out I, I know one of the children of this couple. But you know, I take coffee at Whataburger every morning, Monday through Friday. Do some of my best preaching down there, if any of y'all are interested. Um, and there's a group of old geezers that sit around the table together. Don't laugh, there's room for another one. <laughs> yeah, you've been there, I've seen you there. <laughs> you old geezer. We, we even got Don to buy a geezer bike. So as I sat around the table with the old geezers, we opened up the whole bit column. And the first thing we noticed was two pictures. And both husband and wife are in the pictures. And they said, well, now surely both people didn't die at the same time. And then we looked and both names were at the top of the page. And then the next comment was probably a horrible car crash. And then we read the first paragraph. Almost 70 years ago, Connolly Tibbs Jr. and Johnny Fay Cluck, I didn't bring my glasses, I'm sorry, decided to build a life together, and they were married, thank you, on November the 20th, 1943, almost 70 years ago. On June the 8th, 2013, their eternal life together began, only separated from each other for four and a half hours. Turns out they were living together at Wisteria Place, an assisted living center, and this couple, married for nearly 70 years, actually died four and a half hours apart, according to the obit seemingly by natural causes. This is the part I want you to hear. So when the silence was broken around the table of the old geezers, we all confessed that we would give back our education, our fortunes that we had compiled, our accolades, our certificates, our recognition, we would give back everything that we had accomplished in this life if we could be that guy. That just felt like a story I needed to share with you on Father's Day. And I, I would be remiss to mention that one of our own, a member of First Christian Church, who came to Bible study with us at Paul and Sarah Graham's house for most of eight years, J.D. Carter passed away this week and held his funeral on Friday. He and his wife would have been married 71 years on August the 1st. So, beautiful stories on Father's Day. I have another friend who's going to India this summer on a mission trip. And you know, when somebody's going back home, how you ask them, would you do me a favor? You know, friends of mine go to Tennessee. It's like, bring me back some moonshine or something that you can't do for yourself, right? I said, if you're going to India, would you do something for me? And he looked at me really puzzled, like, what could you want me to do in India? And he said, well, I guess, what would it be? I said, would you take my electric bill over there and ask somebody what it is they're trying to say to me? I can't understand them on the telephone. <laughs> In all seriousness, though, I wanted to tell you a story that Philip Yancey tells. Philip Yancey wrote books on pain and suffering and where is God when the suffering comes. And he wrote a lot of these books with a friend of his, Dr. Paul Brand. And Dr. Paul Brand spent a number of years in India working with lepers. And on one of his early visits, <clears throat> Dr. Brand was being overwhelmed by the number of people that he was seeing for whom there was no hope at all. Case after case, he began to ask himself, why am I even here? I don't know if I can help any of these people. And then came a man who had a condition that was treatable. 
And Dr. Brand got very excited. And so he began to explain to the man. He put his hand on him and he said, we've got something we can do for you and you're going to be all right. You've got to go through this procedure and that procedure and it'll take this much time. But at the end of it, we're sure that you can be well. And he's speaking to the man through an interpreter and the man began to weep. And Dr. Brand asked the interpreter, Why is he crying? Does he not understand what I am telling him is good news? The interpreter asked the man a question and then he looked at Dr. Brand and he said, He understood you, sir. He is weeping because no one has touched him in 15 years. We are talking in this season about what it means to be church. How do we reach outside the walls of church? And I want to take just a moment, sort of outside the context, to remind you of something. We're doing some great work on our facility because we're hosting people on July the 7th. And we need to do that work. And it has brought about a a, a solidarity in our fellowship that we haven't enjoyed in quite a while. We found something to polarize around. It's new toilets, but nonetheless, we found something. <laughs> and I'm just laughing because I'm not, I'm not really making light of it. I think it's a very good thing that we're doing. And I want you at the same time to know that some of our best work has been done in our youth and children's ministries. And the proof is that if you walk down the hall... Remember last week I told you our fourth and fifth grade girls, we have a grand total of two of them, are taking pictures of you doing things that make you church because according to their bulletin board down the hall, it says at the top, Wiley Christian Church is more than a building. So be encouraged by both things that we are coming together and putting our finances together and our energy together and we are taking pride in this facility and at the same time the young people who we have trusted to God and have done our best to teach from perhaps our starting point of dysfunction ourselves are teaching us back. It's more than a building. And last week I reminded you according to our mission statement that we have a mission to allow God to draw the world to Christ and by using our lives every day to do so. And I told you that beyond that mission, there's a place where the philosophy and the ideology and the theology all meet the ground. And at that place, what we are really asking you to do is to roll up your sleeves and help us. I even told you that if you weren't ready to serve, it was better to come and participate week by week and be served until you felt that God had worked with you and gotten you to the place of servanthood. I'm going to keep working on you for a few weeks. We're going to the next level, baby. Come on, go with me. I'm, I'm encouraged that there aren't a whole house full of you here today. God has a way of getting those here that are ready for this message. So today I want to take one bullet out of our vision statement. Now remember our mission is what we're up to. What our big mission is. And then our vision statement in four bullets says how it is that we're going to accomplish that mission. And today I want to take, not in the order you say them each week, but I want to take this bullet point from our vision statement that one of the ways we accomplish our mission is to follow Christ in servanthood. And on this Father's Day, I want to talk to you about servanthood and power. You know, there are a great number of addictions in our society these days. I would dare wager that every one of us in this room practices one of them. And the most intoxicating addiction in our whole culture is that to power, to being right. And so I want to talk to you about servanthood and power. Did you know we think of servanthood in the church and servanthood in the community as these little jobs that we do. 
The things that we do that enable other people. And so we may say to ourselves, well, I have made that, that point. I've joined the church, and now I'm doing. I'm in there, man, and I'm, I'm working on the facility, and I'm doing things for other people, and I'm giving money, and I'm serving. And that's right. That's service. Anytime you stop on the corner and you hand money to that homeless person, that's an act of service. Anytime you visit a prisoner in the jail, that's an act of service. Anytime you play on the praise team, anytime you pray with a person who is hurting, that's an act of service. But you thought it was servanthood, but it's not. It's it's there, it's the nuts and bolts, and if you are truly a servant, you will, be, you will be doing acts of service, but you will be doing them with something that, that perhaps secular organizations who serve the public don't touch upon, but Jesus won't let alone. You see, servanthood is not just something you do, it's an attitude. It's actually something that you become. It gets inside you and you can't even perform an act of service in the same way anymore because you have become the servant. For Paul, he likes to think of it this way. Jesus and God are the same. There's an equality in Jesus and God in form when Jesus is outside the body. Paul is clear, and he's also clear that, that Jesus, the servant, as, as a humble servant, Jesus would never, never consider equality with God as something to be pondered. But Paul goes there for him and says, Jesus, being God in form, was there in heaven with all that it has to offer outside the body Yet he becomes a slave to the flesh, like you and I. Jesus clothes himself in flesh, and Paul equates that to humility. Think about it. Think about it. If you are at God's right hand, is this where you want to go next? If you are enjoying all that is to be enjoyed in the presence of God and in what we have called heaven for so long, would you sign up to leave for a while? Yet in his humility, Jesus becomes not only human, but subjects himself to death and even to death violently at the hands of those to whom he has come to serve. In the flesh, Jesus humbly serves. Paul points that out. It's about how you handle power, humility, and attitude. And for Jesus, it becomes a matter of humbling oneself to be exalted. For in Matthew's gospel, Jesus points out that all who are humble will be exalted. Even that is a paradox, my friends. You cannot set out on a journey to humble yourself so that you might at the end become the exalted one. If you start, do you get the attitude thing again? Do you understand me? If you start from the beginning point with, I'm going to be less of me so that God may raise me up and others might look up to me, you've already failed. You've started from the wrong place. Again, servanthood is an attitude. This is a great message for Father's Day. Listen to me, men of all ages. I want to talk to you about initiation into life. You know, some of you have heard a lot about, and maybe a few of you here today have been through the rites of passage that some are trying to put together now in our culture because we've forgotten. We've forgotten how to help young men handle and understand the power that they have. We have forgotten it, we have neglected it, and now we have generations of old men who never learned. 
those lessons of humility. And these people are not to be despised or disdained. They are our fathers. They are our elders. They are us. And no one is doing any less than the best that they can. But initiation was always about helping the young man understand how to handle power. And that power was not for the benefit of the person, but for the benefit of the community. The power you have, men and women, is for the benefit of your families, your communities, your congregations. Now, I'm going to touch briefly on this, not to be sexist or uh, not to offend any gender, but classically throughout history, most people say that many cultures didn't initiate young women because life had a way of doing it itself. From menstruation to childbirth, women were constantly taught that your life is not your own. Think about it, gentlemen. These ladies, many of them, have carried a child inside their body that threatened their very existence. Some of them will suffer from osteoporosis as they get older because the fetus was draining their body of calcium. Think about it, men. These ladies get this. And, and all of you know that it, if you make it through nine months and through hours of labor and childbirth, then the journey is just beginning for the next 18 years and beyond. Your life does not belong to you anymore. And women somehow always found a way to cluster up. Now, that may not always be the case. Our culture may be different. But classically, women always found a way to go to each other and lean on each other. Men, all we've ever done is bump chess. I mean, whether it's in the church or whether it's at the gym, it's just like we just can't get over ourselves. It's hard to trust someone, especially another man. I'm going to get off the topic again, <laughs> Have y'all saw that new Will Smith movie? The one they're all criticizing because it's a vacation in Costa Rica for him and his son is what it is. And the critics saw through it. But he's the old soldier and he's injured and he's monitoring the progress of his young son who couldn't even make it past cadet in the military academy. And, and there he's, he's trying to help this boy who's never been able to do anything right, especially the physical challenges and he's so stoic. I saw that movie and I cried through the whole thing because it was my father and me, my dad, the consummate Marine, who, who his way of saying I love you is abort the mission and return home immediately. <laughs> I mean, it's what he's saying. I'm, I love you. I don't want anything to happen to you. Man, we need help with power because even today, with all that has been done, and rightly so, to bring about more equality amongst gender as well as race. We need help with power because we have this inherent power and we don't know how to use it. At my house, guys, this is just one thing that, that I hope I'm waking up to. At my house... There was one argument that I could use, one card I could play that seemed to end all arguments in my mind, and it was, well, I pay for everything around here. I'm the one with the job. You know, I thank God that somewhere in the last two years, something went on inside me that, that says, you know, that's not the only thing that it takes to make this family stay together, is you having a job and you're paying for everything. Why do you think that that money card trumps everything else, Doug? Why? Now, I'm trying to get over it. <laughs> I'm trying. But I wonder, does that creep into our congregations and our social life at times? Are there those maybe in, in other organizations who think, well, I gave the money, are there others who 
subject themselves to that and empower those? And it's not always just the money. It's everything. I can beat you at arm wrestling. <laughs> I don't know if I can out arm wrestle my wife anymore. I'm not going to try. <laughs> Men, we need help with power because we need to see ourselves as servants to our family. You understand? We need to see ourselves as those who serve, not those who are there to be served. We need to set an example for our children and the youth in our communities and in our congregations that we don't have to be right. We don't have to win the argument. We don't have to have the biggest piece of chicken on the platter or even the last one that you can take my blanket, that I could give up my bed for you and still get up and go to work tomorrow. Come on, guys, join me. Hold me accountable. If you don't join me, I'm not going to get this. I'm just the messenger. I'm not the one who knows how to do all this stuff. I need your help. By the way, there is a time to be served, too. I do want you to know that. The same Jesus who is washing the feet of the disciples a few, a few paragraphs earlier is having oil poured out over his own head and his own feet. And he is just as graceful at receiving that as he is at turning it around and giving it back. Servanthood does not end. We got this thing wrong, folks. I hate that. Sometimes I'm sitting there listening to people preach and I want to go up there and go, man, we got it wrong. (laughs) No, it's okay. We can start over. Because you know people are just saying the things they've heard and they don't even know what they're saying. They don't listen to me. Listen, I don't know how many times people have said to me, I'm a servant of God and I'm in a prison ministry and we are taking Christ into the prisons. I'm a servant of God and and we are going out and feeding the poor and the homeless because we are being Christ to those people. And then you read Matthew 25 and what does it say? Jesus said, I was in prison. He didn't say, I was in the group that went into the prison to see all those poor devilish people. Jesus said, no, 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 no. I was the prisoner, that devilish person you saw, that hollow person, that empty person. That was me. I was homeless, and you fed me. I was naked, and you put clothes on me. I was sick, and you couldn't heal me, but you came to see me. You see, we got it wrong. When we went into the jail, we weren't being Jesus. We went in there and found Jesus. I went all the way to Africa to take Jesus to some people. And you know what I found when I got there? (laughs) I found Jesus. When you give something to that homeless person on the street, as an act of servanthood, you just gave something to Jesus. There is an attitude to servanthood. It requires great perseverance. It requires continuing when others don't seem to respond and when they just want to take more and take more and spend it on something you didn't want them to or, or not do something to better. And you've got to stay strong. Servanthood is an attitude. It's who you are. As others see us serve, they indeed see Jesus. More paradox. For as we give a cup of water to Jesus on the street, Jesus says himself, I am present in the one who serves. May God empower us as we strive to do this. This is the most difficult part. My grandmother was... A wonderful little Appalachian woman who was as humble as anyone I ever met. Could have owned a whole mountain herself. I don't know why she'd want to. There wasn't anything up there but rocks. But it was hers. She chose instead to live in town with her family and not return to the home place. But she came from very, very humble and poor roots. 
And I remember the day I said to her, Mamma, I've been reading the Bible, and there's this passage in there that says you are to regard others as better than yourselves. And she said, uh-uh, it is not in that Bible. And I said, well, it is. And I went to look for it. And it took me a long time to find it, because if you were like me, when I first started reading the Bible, I could remember things that were there. I just couldn't remember where they were. By the way, Scott Miller is going to give you a class this fall that will help you if you have that problem. Be, be, be ready and be listening for that. But... I remember the day I read it to her, and she could not internalize that. There's no way. She had been looked down upon and let others dictate her self-esteem to her for so long that she had lost her own power and her own inherent dignity. The closest she could come to retaining dignity was to say, No, sir, I'm as good as anybody else. Well, ma'am, all you were right. But Jesus, through the Apostle Paul here, is trying to teach us something. Remember this as I close. Anytime Jesus is doing something magnificent or grandeur in the Gospels, like walking on water and feeding a bunch of people and healing people in an instant and all of that stuff, and you're caught up in that, and it's like, wow, I'd like to see that movie. And it's like, don't miss the real point. Every time Jesus is doing that, he's doing something else. And you're reading over it. He is always, always saying things like, you're a daughter of Israel. You are a son of God. You have faith greater than all of Israel. Jesus never fails to respect and to magnify human dignity in every person that Christ encounters. God, forgive me for the days that I have thrown service at people and looked down my nose at them like if you were as good as me, you wouldn't need this help. God, forgive me. Servanthood is truly a matter of the heart. He's done as much with this feeling organ as it is with him. May God use your heart and mine to draw the world to the compassionate Christ who is ready to give us our dignity. Will you pray with me?